Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Bridging the Gap, Assessing, Empowering, and Engaging People with Disabilities in the Outdoors. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 206th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. This webinar is being recorded. It includes a real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Links for the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz, as well as the survey, will be in the chat box. And attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording, the transcript, uh, the resources slide with the presenter email, and as well as learning credit details within two days following the webinar. And this um, webinar is free to the public thanks to our webinar partners uh, that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And I'm happy to introduce our webinar presenter for today. We have Mayan Ziv, who is the founder and CEO with Access Now. So I will pass controls over to Mayan to get started. Thank you so much, Candice. Uh, hi, everyone. It's so great to be here today. And uh, thank you for joining wherever you are. I am based here in Toronto, Canada, and I'm so excited to share with you, um, hopefully what will be a illuminating conversation uh, and leave you with some food for thought. So I am sharing my screen. Hopefully everything is working. Yes, perfectly. Um, and we're gonna just jump right in. So a bit on me to start. Um, I always like to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Mayan Ziv. I am a power wheelchair user. There is an image of me right now on the slide in my wheelchair, uh, actually out on a trail <laughs> uh, with a big set of stairs right behind me. Uh, and I am a disability activist and the founder and CEO of Access Now. I love to share all different types of educational information and insights about accessibility on social media. So if today is interesting to you uh, and you want to learn more, feel free to reach out. I started my journey um, also using a mobility device. Uh, ever since I can remember, I have been a, a person with a disability, even if I didn't really know what that meant. <laughs> Growing up, I didn't really know um, that there was anything really fundamentally different about me, but I did notice pretty early on that I was having different experiences than a lot of my friends or my sisters or my family members, my colleagues. Um, I didn't always um, get around the same way. I had challenges engaging uh, with, with places or experiences. And I started feeling this friction or this mismatch. Um, and as I grew up and, and into adulthood, this challenge, this experience followed me everywhere. So I, I always look for fun and engaging ways to do things. And I often do still come across barriers. And the reality is that there are, are millions of places around the world um, that are still inaccessible to people with disabilities. And this example, on the slide right now of an image of just one step to a restaurant uh, is, is a barrier for many people. And it's one of the more common ones that we know about, but there are many different types of barriers, both built into the environment, as well as uh, attitudinal barriers and invisible barriers that prevent people from, from reaching their full potential, doing the things that they want to do. And these experiences of, of being a person myself who uses a wheelchair, who constantly was experiencing frustration and trying to get out into the world and do things is really what motivated me initially to start looking for solutions, looking for things that could solve my problem. If I wanted to go to a restaurant, I wanted information about whether or not that space would be wheelchair accessible, whether or not they had a washroom that would actually accommodate me or a parking spot if I was traveling uh, with my car uh, that's modified for me. I was constantly asking these questions and I was coming up with short answers. There was not really a lot of information 
not enough information that gave me um, a sense of confidence. And even when I would pick up the phone and call people, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've called, um, let's say a hotel and I ask specific questions and then I show up, you know, bags ready. I've traveled a long way and I get to the hotel and there are five steps to the entrance because they didn't realize that uh, what they call a ramp is actually just a delivery ramp and it's too narrow and doesn't work for my wheelchair. And so those constant issues um, were just driving me to the point of, of exhaustion and frustration and uh, I needed to do something about it. And the reality is that it, this is not just my problem. <laughs> uh, today, one in four Americans live with a disability. Uh, over a billion people around the world experience some form of disability. And that means that actually every single person on the planet has a relationship to disability or accessibility. Uh, and although we don't often talk about it, and not everybody is fully made aware, disability is everywhere. And so the work that we have to do is to unlearn some of the, the inherent bias and the, the barriers that have been built into the way that we've designed things that unintentionally exclude people with various different lived experiences. And that's why uh, we, we work at Access Now to help remove some of those question marks. We work to establish a world's go-to resource for accessibility information so that whoever you are, wherever you are, you can find the insights you need to make informed decisions. People with disabilities make up a mass market. We are one of the largest uh, untapped potential groups in the world uh, with over $58 billion a year just spent on travel alone, $13 trillion uh, in, in uh, consumer spending annually that the disability market contributes to. And knowing that there is so much potential, uh, we realize that one of the best opportunities is to connect audiences, folks that have information to share, organizations that can share information about accessibility, about their services and experiences, as well as connect that information with the audience of people like myself and millions of others who are looking for those insights, who are looking for accessible experiences, places of belonging, places that will welcome us, and most importantly, that this information will be trusted, that it will be authentic, and that we have the information we need to know before we go. And that's really what's grown Access Now from that day one of me kind of stuck in the street, being frustrated uh, over eight years ago to a point where now we have been able to connect people with real insights, with disabilities and, and people without disabilities all around the world who are sharing insights and information about their experiences related to accessibility of all different types of places, of restaurants, of storefronts, hotels, parks, uh, all kinds of different places, office buildings, so that together we work to share information and uncover some of those question marks, some of that kind of buried knowledge that many of us carry around. And I'm really proud. <laughs> you know, this grassroots movement, we've been able to share over a million locations rated from the perspectives of people with and without disabilities, sharing insights about accessibility in over 107 countries all with one mission, to make the world more accessible and connect people with the insights to make their lives and their dreams a reality. And now all of this really changed in 2020. We were primarily focused on the built environment, places that you go to, a movie theater, a coffee shop, a restaurant. And in 2020, all of that changed. In 2020, the world shut down and nobody was going anywhere. And we sat at Access Now and we asked ourselves, how can we be helpful? And we had to ask even some difficult questions about our own inherent bias, about where people with disabilities are invited to belong. And yes, okay, the schools, the hospitals, the stores, transportation, but what about the outdoors? And so in partnership with a founding partner, Trans Canada Trail, we started asking these questions. How can we work 
to uncover insights about the accessibility of the trail, of the Trans Canada Trail specifically. And how can we do what we've done at Access Now so well in terms of engaging people with disabilities to share? How can we now work to reduce and remove barriers and highlight the best of the best when it comes to the accessibility of the trail? So we started in 2020 with 13 trail sections engaging 12 Paralympic athletes across the country remotely by engaging with them in their own communities in the middle of a lockdown uh, to start to ask and uncover some of these questions. What do we mean when we talk about accessibility outdoors? What is important to people with various lived experiences of disabilities when we are addressing accessibility of parks and trail spaces and recreational spaces? What are the things that are important to us? And so I can tell you from my perspective as a power wheelchair user, my experiences with navigating the outdoors are vastly different from someone who is non-sighted or someone who might have an invisible disability or someone who is experiencing a temporary disability or a flare up and might need different um, things from the, from the spaces they look for. I might look for wide and, and kind of paved spaces. Someone might want to look for additional rest stops along the way, whereas someone else might be looking for a challenge where they're not just going to be cruising along a, a paved flat trail. And so all of these things started coming up for us and we were asking ourselves questions about how can we work to do what we've done at Access Now, which is share insights that don't prescribe in information, don't tell our community, what they should and should not be doing? How can we share information that empowers our community to make their own decisions, that is reflective of the lived experiences and the authenticity of our experiences in the data we share? And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. And our big goal from that starting point in 2020, and as we've grown to today in working in the outdoors, is really to help people with disabilities and many others who require information about accessibility, consider parents with strollers and aging population. There are many people who experience temporary or, or moments of access need that might not be defined by disability specifically, but we all look for the same types of information. Information that can empower us to make decisions, to self-assess, to trip plan, whether it's at home, or while we're already out somewhere, and the entire idea is to help reduce that anxiety and that risk of experiencing barriers so that people don't feel excluded, don't feel that they are um, not invited or not welcome to engage in, in the outdoors, because we know that the outdoors are incredibly important for our physical and our mental well being. And that's what led us to Access Outdoors. <laughs> so in addition to the Access Now app, we've developed a methodology of sorts in which we engage people with disabilities to share, to share their insights the same way they've always done with us on the Access Now app, but to, to more in-depth share information about the outdoors specifically. And what I'm gonna do is kind of walk you through some of the, the, the prompts, some of the ways that we think about the outdoors when it comes to accessibility specifically, so that we can uncover those insights that really inform the authentic data that our community looks for. Now, I do wanna mention briefly that this is in no way an audit. We are not a company that is coming in with measuring tapes. We are not um, certifying or crediting uh, the spaces that we reassess. We do this from the perspective of authentic lived experience, connecting the community to share insights in which we can share with each other the types of information that you might ask your friend or look for on a, on a, on a Google review. The entire idea is about representation. And that's really what we're aiming to do. I'm gonna talk more about that as I get to the end, but it's just important to know that I'm not leading you through any type of legal standard or framework. I'm really prompting you to think about themes and topics that accessibility can guide you to doing more of that work if you're interested. And so we've categorized our thinking uh, when it comes to the accessibility of, of parks and trails into six main themes, terrain, amenities, access points, places, hazards, and closures. And each one of these themes 
um, we, we look for different types of information, uh, all related to the accessibility of those experiences. And now I'm going to walk you through each one briefly. <clears throat> Once everything is done, we this is kind of what it looks like. Really, I just wanted to kind of throw this up so that as we walk through them all, you kind of get an idea. But we end up sharing live on the Access Now map uh, the trail spaces that we've mapped out. So this is an example of the Martin Goodman Trail or the Waterfront Trail in downtown Toronto. We've been able to share information about accessible parking, uh, accessible park spaces, um, and the line, the green line, uh, is letting us know information about the terrain. On the side, we've got the actual listing that shows up on Access Now. And if you were to scroll down, you'd see many other people engaging. Um, so check it out on Access Now if you're interested in learning more. Uh, and as I've mentioned, accessibility means different things to different people. So keep that in mind as, as I go through the information is that we're really looking from a perspective of a broad um, framework of thinking that allows people to share their own insights. So when it comes to accessibility ratings, which is the first starting point that we use to kind of address every element of accessibility at the highest level, uh, we're really thinking broadly. Everything from accessible to not accessible can kind of be categorized into three groups. And we ask people to bring their own experiences to that lens. So when we speak about a space that's accessible, because we work in 107 countries, we're also speaking about spaces that can respond to many different types of, of laws and regulations and standards. We're speaking about places in general that are barrier and obstacle free. And that in itself is interpreted differently by someone who uses a wheelchair or someone who's non-sighted or someone who might be deaf or have a, a different type of disability. An obstacle free experience is manifested in different ways to different people. And that's why I kind of add that accessibility means different things to different people. And I'll give you some examples as we kind of go along. But the point is not to ever say that accessible is always, you know, wide, flat, hard, easy, safe trails, but that in general, it should be obstacle free and it should allow the widest possible group to engage. The largest um, community possible should be able to look at information on the Access Now app, for example, and say accessible, okay, I'm safe, I'm good to go. But I can tell you when we get into the partially accessible category, uh, that's where things get really interesting. That's where when we say things that it requires caution or deliberate physical effort to travel or traverse through those spaces, on our, on our platform, we've got um, adventurists. We've got folks that are you know, adaptive mountain bike users who are looking for more challenging trails. They'll still want an accessible washroom, but the trail itself, uh, they might want something that's more dynamic, that isn't, you know, flat and wide uh, or, or all the time. Um, so partially accessible, um, there's a lot of space in there for people to make their own decisions. And, and the more information we can share about what that means, the more likely people will feel empowered to make their own decisions about whether or not that still meets their needs. Whereas a space that's not accessible, that's where significant barriers come up. That's where, you know, it's untraversable to a very large population. There might be, um, you know, unsafe terrain. Um, widths that are too narrow for mobility devices to pass through, which start to make it no longer enjoyable or not just a, a fun challenge. Uh, and so when we look at terrain specifically, there are a few elements that we ask ourselves about. We look at the surface, you know, what is the quality of the terrain? What is the texture of it? Those things can make a difference. What's the slope angle? I'll talk to you more about how we collect that, as well as the width, you know, these simple elements. Um, although not always considered accessibility criteria, very much helps someone with a disability determine whether or not that's going to be uh, a trail uh, that meets their needs. So although we don't always think about everything from the lens of access, when we apply information that we might already know about to a community of folks who are interested in learning more about the accessibility of those spaces, the more insight and the more information we can share, the more likely that that person who's looking for information is going to be able to uncover or 
or understand the type of context that will help them decide, you know, is this something where I can go with a manual wheelchair uh, or do I need my the third power wheel attached to the back? Or is this something that I might want to rent out a piece of equipment to go and enjoy? Uh, everything from asphalt to boardwalks to gravel, even the, the texture or the density of the gravel can make a difference. We always like to share this information because the surface type of the terrain is one of the most important things, especially for people with mobility devices that will, that will be needed um, to make a decision. For example, heavy sand is a no-go for me and for most people who use any type of wheeled mobility device. So sharing that information, although we might not consider it to be quote unquote accessibility data or ADA data is very much considered within the context of people making decisions about their accessible experiences. And there are many types of obstacles that can come up just when it comes to the terrain. And we like to kind of categorize these into two themes, traversable obstacles, things that we can address, or things that can be um, navigated around, and untraversable ones. And right now on the list, we're talking about traversable things being like sticks, foliage, debris, you know, small pebbles, little cracks or bumps. Um, but those are mobility related. We can also think about things like branches or, or overhead uh, brush that uh, if someone is non-sighted, is passing through, might end up kind of smacking them in their face as they're navigating through a, a trail experience and hopefully independently so. And so, yes, it's traversable, but is it enjoyable? Um, so we don't make that distinction. We allow our community to decide for themselves if this is something that they're going to be comfortable with and is this going to be an experience that, they, um, that they're prepared for and willing to go out and have. Again, it's always about empowering people to make their own decisions. And never do we say, this is for wheelchair users, this is not for people who are blind, because it's not really up to us to decide what people should or should not be doing. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier that we also collect information about the slope and the grade of trails. In generating the types of insights that we've had from our community, we've also been able to invest in some proprietary technology that actually listens. So taking out some of the guesswork, the app that we've developed allows people to simply start tracking and go along their journey. And by doing that, they can help us to measure the elevation, the slope, the roughness, the side slope, simply by going about their, their day. And whenever possible, we like to make sure that our technology is getting out of the way. And so it's not always about kind of directly engaging, but also about passive listening. I'm bringing up the example of sensor data because that's something that we've invested in at Access Now. But as you go about your thinking about how to engage people with disabilities, yes, active engagement um, is critical to understanding and uncovering some of the barriers. But what other ways can we listen to, monitor, support the communities or travelers or visitors who are coming to our spaces without necessarily asking them to do the work, not necessarily um, needing them to, to invest a lot of time and energy in order to still uncover those results. And I'm gonna to continue to go through our list um, of different types of themes or topics that we think about when we look at the accessibility of parks and trails. Amenities is one of the most important things that comes up all the time within the Access Now community, because this is where beyond the trail texture terrain, um, specifically, we start to get into what's my day gonna be like? What's my trip gonna be like? Am I going to have enough bench space along my journey to be resting if, if we're talking about someone who might need that additional support? Are the picnic tables, for example, accessible in a way that someone who is using a mobility device or a wheelchair specifically can actually drive up to the table and feel included as opposed to feeling like a, an odd add-on at the end of the table? So we look for longer edges on picnic tables. When we look at parking, we look at how many spots are available and how close are they to the, to the trailhead or to an access point. We look at if there is space for someone to unload uh, their own mobility device or their equipment in that parking lot. 
Uh, you know, some people are traveling with additional equipment that they're looking to use and enjoy out on the trail. Is there space within a parking space uh, area for them to actually unload safely, do a transfer? Those are the types of things that we're asking people to look at. And even something like a water fountain, is that at a height that's lower, is there a path to the water fountain that is clear of debris, uh, that doesn't have additional barriers to actually access that space? Uh, and washrooms. Washrooms, number one. This is the question we probably get asked the most often. Because although the trail itself might be accessible, if there is not an accessible washroom available, that's going to dramatically limit the amount of engagement and enjoyability that our community is going to feel comfortable with. Uh, and so we always share information about every single washroom, whether it be accessible or not, so that people can make those decisions. You think about people who are doing multi-day trips or people who are planning a big trek. Um, sometimes people are looking for showers. You know, we've got uh, a community of, of users who travel and access trails across Canada specifically. And if they're not able to find an accessible shower where they can actually enter an accessible washroom area, and move into a barrier-free roll-in shower area, then that no longer becomes um, as much of an enjoyable or welcoming experience. So all of these types of information inform the decisions that our community makes about whether or not they will feel welcome, whether or not this is a space that not only is accessible, but promotes an experience of belonging. Another one is information. When we think about signage and maps, how much of that information is in flat text that someone who is non-sighted can actually access? Do you have digital versions of that information that are accessible via accessible mobile apps? Perhaps you have um, digital navigation or wayfinding opportunities to allow people to use technologies like BlindSquare, uh, where they can actually navigate independently through a space. Uh, and, and these types of elements, again, reinforce this concept of welcoming and belonging. Whenever we can, through technology or through information, reinforce to people that they are considered and that our needs are heard, it is a dramatically different experience than just simply um, you know, covering off the basics, making sure that you can say, yes, we're compliant and moving forward. We're really talking about customer service. We're talking about enjoyability and all of the amenities that people might access through a space are also incredibly important when applied through the lens of accessibility. So access points. This is something I mentioned a little bit earlier as well. Access points are tricky because um, not all access points are accessible. Um, you might have a, stair a staircase that is leading to uh, an element of a trail. Uh, the trailhead might be accessible, but then once you're on the trail, you're going to be stuck on it uh, for a very long period of time before you might be able to get off. Um, and access points kind of help people plan in advance. You know, what are they going to be facing? I can tell you that uh, it can be uh, uh, quite a, it can provide quite a lot of anxiety uh, when you are going out into the unknown. Uh, looking to enjoy an amazing day outside uh, in nature. Uh, perhaps you're you're interested in birding, which is something that I've recently learned quite a lot about and I'm really excited about. Um, and if you are not able to identify in advance uh, where your next ac accessible access point is, where you might be able to get off a trail, uh, who might be able to pick you up and where, uh, if you're planning ahead for accessible transportation, is it a loop or not? Um, these types of insights make a world of difference uh, to someone who might not have been out on a trail before and doesn't know what they're going to be facing. So we we ask questions about, you know, are there safe crosswalks? You know, is this a, an area where someone who is traveling independently uh, would be safe to, to even cross a street? Um, is there a designated area where someone is going to be able to navigate? Um, is the terrain changing? So we always, every time there's a change in terrain surface, we always make note.
because you might be facing um, a very enjoyable um, texture that works for your needs. And then all of a sudden at the access point, it changes to something that is no longer accessible. So that always that also makes a difference about whether or not that access point is accessible. Um, and is it, of course, barrier free? Are there parking options at that space? All of these elements add into whether or not an access point specifically would make um, would make the difference for someone to be able to access that space or not. And I mentioned places. Um, this is obviously where Access Now started. Um, points of interest is something that um, people come to Access Now for. They're looking for monuments. They're looking for uh, attractions and museums and um, and and sculptures and. And if you think about the, the experiences that people have or the decisions that we make when we want to go and venture out to, let's say, a gorgeous park uh, with a phenomenal trail that we've heard all about, because there's this one point, this one vista, this one lookout point that's like mm, gorgeous Instagram moment, right? And then what happens when you've done all the work you arranged for accessible transportation for that day. You rented um, your modified hand cycle that you want to use for the day. You got out on the trail. You got everything ready to go. You've got snacks, you're comfortable. You're, you go out on this wonderful experience. And then when you get to that moment, you realize that actually it's not uh, accessible to you. That's a huge letdown. <laughs> Uh, or your friends continue on and you have to wait at the bottom of a staircase, which is something that's happened to me. Uh, they'll FaceTime me from the top. <laughs> Not quite the same experience. So letting people know about those highlights. Oh, my finger. I'll go back. Uh, letting people know about those highlights, those points of interest, uh, which are often also labeled within Access Now as distinct places um, that ha might have their own listing with a whole variety of other information attached to them, it provides people with, with that uh, assurance that they're going to have the best enjoyable experience they, they're looking for. Uh, and again, it's an important element to consider. So we, we always wanna make sure that people can get to the waterfall uh, or the zip line uh, or the activity. And if it's not included within the information we're sharing, then it leaves, leaves that uh, kind of open-ended question mark uh, where now our community is starting to second guess, question, well, is it gonna be worth it? Should I still go? I'm not sure if I'll be able to access what I want or get to where I need. And, and that's exactly the type of, of um, hesitance um, that we're looking to kind of solve for. Those frustrating moments of being stuck out somewhere and not included within the, within the experience uh, is really what we aim to solve for. And hazards. So hazards can be really anything. They can be things like potholes or routes, dangerous changes to tactile navigation guides. You know, perhaps you're you're guiding, uh, you're you're navigating along a trail, and then all of a sudden it leads you, you know, into a, a very open-ended area that has a drop. Uh, you know, you'd want to know that before you get close to the edge that that's about to happen. If there aren't tactile strips, if there aren't markings. Um, or distinct areas that you can kind of know in advance, um, you can get into all different types of situations, especially if you're non-sighted or with folks who are. Uh, and so uh, we always come from the perspective of independence first. Uh, it's not truly accessible if a person with any disability cannot truly be empowered to make their own decisions and navigate and, and do so feeling like they're, they've got the autonomy to do that. Um, once you start being in the in in the position where you have to rely on someone, it's not truly as accessible or as inclusive as we would like it to be. And so, although it's not always perfect, we always like to let people know what they're going to face. So things like railway tracks, um, you know, big roots in the ground, these are things to note uh, so that people can kind of know in advance. You know, okay, well, at this point in the trail, I'm going to face additional obstacles. Um, sometimes these hazards also impact the line or the terrain. Uh, so we go from a green to a yellow. And that kind of lets people know that in a certain area, there are additional things to keep note of. 
Um, but but often they can just be in, uh, instances along a trail that is totally accessible that we just want people to be aware of. So it's really a note of caution and really just asks people to pay slightly closer attention to the information shared. And closures. Similarly to access points, closures are, are, are um, those areas that can kind of help people make decisions in advance if they're trip planning. So if an area is closed off due to construction or um, you know, change in weather, um, uh, determining in advance an, an alternative navigation plan is something that takes time to do. Uh, so, okay, well, I know that the, the trail stops at this point, but the only next accessible access point uh, is, is quite a bit further away than what I had initially planned to do today. So keeping that in mind, um, helps people again to reduce that anxiety or or those those barriers even in thought that might suggest that this is not a space um, that's going to meet their needs when often it is it just requires an alternative route. Um, alternative routes come up a lot for us. Let's say there are access points with stairs or bridges that we need to cross that have steps or lips. Um, we'll often track people's movements as we always do through the Access Outdoors app. And then we'll use that as a, as a way to determine what the alternative route should be. Uh, so those alternative routes, those detours, might not be initially considered accessibility features, but often when we look at spaces that might be not accessible, if we think about what we would call a red line on Access Now app, what are the alternative ways to still give someone a great experience? Um, so I think it's a, it's another way to, again, add context and insight that can allow people to make their own decisions. And now I really want to talk to you about how we do this. So everything that I've shared so far, again, just briefly, I'm just giving you kind of um, prompts, things to think about when it comes to the accessibility of spaces. But what we rely on at Access Now is our community. We provide all of the people that come through our programs with a, with a kind of a, a, a specific training to prompt them to think about ways to describe and share information. And we rely also on their lived experiences of disability to, to guide us, to show us the way. And so we're really proud of the community that we built because it's the types of data that are generated by our community specifically that also reinforce that trust, reinforce to the community of users who are looking up information that if Lisa, uh, who is um, an avid uh, cyclist who enjoys the outdoors uh, and is able to share information from her point of view, that might help somebody else know that if Lisa can do it, so can they. Uh, and that just like you might call up your friend who um, you know, is really big on, on a certain type of food, that you love um, and you'll ask them, you know, hey, like where's a great place to eat in this neighborhood? Um, the same comes from our community, that camaraderie, that representation, that visibility, that others with disabilities have been involved in the process of actually uncovering the types of usability and experiences on a, in a hands-on way, uh, we feel, that there's no one better for the job. And that yes, we can always engage people that are non-disabled to be part of this work, but that when we provide people with disabilities with the, with the power, with the autonomy to be in the driver's seat, to tell us what is and what is not working, uh, that's the most authentic and best way to, to uncover the things that we might not know about. It's really as simple as user testing. If you're going to create a product in which you want to invite a community of any kind to engage with that product or that service or that experience, if we are not engaging the group directly that is supposed to be the receiver of that product or service or experience, we are not authentically doing what we need to do. And we're not going to create the best results. And so that's really the heart and soul of Access Now is that trust, is that community that we build and that representation that is 
intentionally pan disability. It is not limited to people who are just wheelchair users. It is not limited to any type of, of person or any type of experience. And as we continue to evolve and engage and learn more about the experiences of people with and without disabilities that have not always been confident to share their insights, who have not always been invited to share their expertise, the more that we also uncover and understand what is left to do, what can we do to truly create enjoyable and usable experiences that reflect people's needs intuitively. <clears throat> and that's why we think that the community work is so important. What we do specifically uh, is we engage people where they live. It's kind of something that we're, we're, we're focused on is this concept of regenerative tourism uh, or community impact and engagement. We're looking for that, that ability to build capacity within the own community that it serves. So engaging people, not only to be contributors, but also to help us create education, to help us create awareness, instances in which we can use the information collected, the experiences of navigating through trails to actually educate stakeholders, invite folks from the cities that we work in to learn about what is missing or the opportunity that we have or potentially celebrate how accessible and how inclusive the experiences are, we've just never been able to actually showcase that. People with disabilities have been historically left out of many conversations. And so by putting our community at the center of this work, we ensure that it is authentic and representative of the diverse needs that people with lived experience have. It's a great way to also promote employment opportunities. So all of the mappers who work with us are employed to do so. They have their own expertise and we believe that their disability is an asset, an asset to the work that we are doing, not despite of, not a hindrance, not something that they should be ashamed of, but that disability is actually integral and necessary in order for us to truly even identify what barriers exist. It is from that place that we can work to remove those barriers. And that becomes kind of that next step of creating the measurable impact by engaging, identifying, assessing, and then working to remove uh, or reduce the barriers that are present that we've learned from the folks that we've engaged with. And there are many ways to do this. Uh, so, for one, one example uh, is through what we do on the Access Now app is that once listings, once locations or trails are published uh, with all of the insights that we've uncovered through our mapping assessment process, once they are live on the Access Now app, that's not where the work ends, that's where the work begins. Now we invite our community to engage further, to share their own experiences, and to provide us with updates and insights as they navigate through those trails. So for example, right now on the screen, I've got a slide. There's an image of a trail and a review accompanying it from a user. This is a real review. I've just kind of hidden their identity. Uh, this is a real review that came from a user in which they say, the Saigon Trail is wide paved and mostly accessible Although there are inclines to navigate in and out of the valley, it provides opportunities to observe wildlife. So, so you see, sometimes the reviews are not just specifically about insights about access, but just about the enjoyability. And what's most important is that this user um, specifically wrote, I regularly push my lightweight daughter in her wheelchair along this trail, but be ready for a workout. <laughs> and you see that, that camaraderie, that, that representation to to even have an opportunity to hear from, from a mom who is enjoying an outdoor experience with her daughter, the specific language that she uses, the way in which she frames the context about engaging with her daughter, using a manual wheelchair, and describing all of that from her own perspective, those are the types of moments that come up on the Access Now app all the time. 
And that's what helps us to build that community. When somebody else sees that, that gives them an idea on if this is going to be a space for them. And it's also a way for people to connect with each other. It's through those experiences and those engagements that we build this movement. And it really unites. It unites a, an audience or a community of, of shared interests. And what's cool about it is that disability does not discriminate. Disability will touch every person at some point of their life. Uh, and, and you could be, a, it, it's also intersectional. Disability, you know, it touches gender, it touches race, touches all different types of identities. Uh, and, and what brings us all together is this shared desire to be seen, to be heard, and to simply enjoy to be connected to insights and experiences that will promote that, that experience of belonging and welcome, welcoming. And it's an evergreen process. It never ends. Once you do an assessment, once you go through that initial phase of asking the questions, and hopefully today, all I've done is prompt you to think about it. Um, in no way is this a crash course in everything you need to do to make sure your space is accessible. But the best way to do it is to engage. Engage people with lived experience. Engage organizations that have expertise in this space and begin to ask the questions. I do another talk that's called How to Be an Ally. And in this talk, um, there's many things that I share. But one of the most important things that I always like to lead people with is show up imperfectly. The work is never done. Accessibility is a journey, not a destination. Accessibility, when done correctly, is not a checkbox that we simply mark off and say, okay, our work is done. Let's go back to our regular work. Accessibility is a process of learning and unlearning many of the barriers that have been designed into many of the experiences and decisions we make. And by engaging authentically and, and asking questions and being willing to learn and change, uh, being committed to continuing that process, the better we become and the more comfortable we become with understanding the subject matter. We remove the barriers simply by first understanding them and understanding how they make people feel. What is it like when you're not invited to an experience where everybody else has been, where other people have been represented, uh, where other people don't have challenges getting there? What is that like? What is that moment of feeling excluded feel like? When we start from empathy and engage directly with the community that we wish to serve, that's where we get closer. Uh, and as people share on the Access Now app, even us as a small company, we continue to learn the things that we don't yet know that the community is looking for. And so fast forward to today, <laughs> we went from 2020, um, just starting and learning and getting in uh, into the weeds of it, really, with Trans Canada Trail. Today, we've been able to share over 180 trails, over 700 miles. We've employed over 100 different mappers um, with various different lived experiences to contribute. Uh, and we're excited to invite you to do the same, to join us. If you have questions, you want to learn more, um, this is the journey we're on. And we're so thrilled uh, about the opportunity to share uh, just some of our learning, some of our insights with you. I'm going to leave you with one more point, and then we'll get into a few questions. When we talk about the outdoors, who do we think of? Who are the people that come into our mind? Uh, what are the assumptions we make about how they move through the world, how they interpret information, um, who they are? You know, I can tell you that uh, I never considered myself to be an outdoorsy person. And if I ever said, oh, I'm going for a hike, I felt like I was faced with a lot of assumptions, judgments. It was only through doing this work and continuing down this path that I've learned that even me, as a power wheelchair user, uh, I can go on a hike too. It might look different. It might go at a different pace. But I too uh, am invited because the outdoors are for everyone. And so we really work to leverage insights through information 
to reflect back to people their own representation. That's what this is about. It's about building trust by ensuring that people are reflected in the work that we do, that all people are reflected despite who they are, despite where they live, how they move, how they think, how they speak, what their needs are. Uh, that's really what we do at Access Now. And, and above all, I don't want you to come away from this thinking here's a laundry list of things I have to do, but simply to ask, have you included people with diverse needs of, of all kinds? Have you invited and asked people to share with you what their experiences are like? And from that, that's where the work begins. So thank you for letting me talk at you <laughs> for 50 minutes. Uh, I, I really hope that I've been able to provoke the future and, and further thinking. Uh, at Access Now, this is what we do with all our partners. Um, and whether it's with us or many other organizations that are working in this space, uh, I'm so glad that you showed up today and I encourage you to continue to follow um, this thinking. So happy to answer some questions. Thanks, Candice. Thank you so much, Mayan. I know Corey is on the back end and she's been typing in a bunch of answers to a lot of questions so far. So thank you so much, Corey. And thank you, Mayan, again. Um, a couple questions um, actually are coming from multiple people here. Um, Debbie, as well as Bonnie, are asking, how do you address ensuring the trail conditions, you know, information is kept current, you know, as far as weather, lack of maintenance, et cetera? Yeah, so there's a few ways we go about doing this. So all of the trails that we share on the Access Now app, for example, uh, are done so in partnership with the organizations that represent those trail groups. Uh, so we're, we're, we're checking in, we're, we're not publishing information unless we've confirmed that the data is accurate. So at the first level, that's what we do. But then the whole process is to con continue that engagement. Uh, and so through the Access Now app specifically, or through the Access Outdoors program, our community is constantly sharing with us uh, kind of what's changed, what's come up. So whether it's um, one of our partners going in directly, knowing information and wanting to make a change, which they're able to do, uh, or us learning directly from the community, oh, something has changed. It continues to evolve and grow and be updated based on the information that our community shares. Okay, great. Uh, Elizabeth is asking if your data is shareable. Uh, so, uh, like, yes. <laughs> uh, the Access Now app is free. Uh, everything that you can see on Access Now is available for anyone, anywhere. Um, whether you're on a mobile phone or visiting us on the website, you can do that. Um, I encourage you to check it out, explore. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of insights you can find there. Um, the specifics... Um, when it comes to the outdoors program are a little bit more controlled. So we don't allow uh, any user to just go on the app and start drawing lines. Uh, trails are things that we um, work in partnership with the groups that we work with um, to publish. So we don't um, publish a trail unless our partners are involved. And that data is exchanged, uh, yes, and shared on the Access Now app. Uh, but the data itself is not open source. Uh, it's available to preview um, and you can engage with it that way. Uh, but we don't allow people, let's say, to go on the, on the app and, and download um, the data specifically. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, let's see here. Oh, Lillian, um, she believes, this was earlier in the presentation, she believes that she heard you use the term flat text for signage, she's just um, asking, what is flat text? Oh, sure. Um, so when we think about a sign, um, usually we're thinking about um, a flat surface in which text has been printed and then you know is on the sign, um, but that isn't tactile in any way. Uh, so whether it's braille uh, or three-dimensional text, um, or even a tactile map that allows people to feel out with their fingers the route of a trail, let's say, or um, specific points of interest along the trail. There are many ways to give people an experience that is not kind of what uh, is the first assumption on what that should be. So when we think about how we share information, whether it's through touch, uh, through sound, 
uh, through smell even. Uh, there are many ways that those elements of information can provide people who experience the world in various ways, depending on their disabilities, with additional context. And so when I say flat text, I just simply mean that it's actually not accessible um, to, to a non-sighted person. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jasmine, is, she says, this is great. Thank you so much. How can I get involved? And actually many people are asking the same question. How can I get involved in helping to expand the collected, uh, wait, hold on, sorry. Oh, <laughs> it just went to another question and popped down. Okay. Let's see, how can I get involved in helping to expand the Access Outdoors program in the U.S.? Well, I love that question. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, please reach out to us. If this is something that you're interested in doing, uh, we're sharing our information today to, to invite you to join us. Um, there are a few ways you can get involved. First of all, anyone can go to the Access Now app and share anything you want. Um, so that's free, that's open. If you're interested in doing some of the more invested work on trail mapping specifically, um, that just requires us to kind of be involved. Uh, so we know we need to know who you are. We need to kind of provide you with access. Um, so please reach out if it's something you're interested in, um, and we're happy to guide you uh, in terms of next steps. Wonderful. Um, uh, Will has asked a question that they are primarily a concrete trail, but they are adding a few offshoots that are rocked. And someone has told them that they should put mulch glue on rocks to lock them down to make it better for wheelchairs and similar devices. He's just asking, is that correct? What's your advice on that? Well, I can't get into the specifics because, you know, when you say rocks, it could mean a million different things. Um, but what I will say is that, yes, any type of uneven or cobblestones or gravel, any type of different texture will definitely impact the way that um, a wheeled mobility device will navigate. Uh, even the difference between crushed gravel and, and larger loose gravel, uh, even the density of that gravel can make a difference to how easily someone could navigate through it. So it's hard for me to comment on, on the rocks specifically um, if you can secure them, but I can say even like cobblestones are difficult. So it really depends. Um, would love to learn more. Uh, if you wanna reach out, I'm happy to kind of guide you with that specific answer. Great. Um, Deanne is asking, how is the surface slope and cross slope information measured or collected? Is that collected via a phone app? Yes. Yes. So the sensor data um, that's collected through the Access Outdoors app um, kind of sits in your phone uh, quietly and is activated when someone starts tracking. So if you think of Strava or kind of any of your uh, navigation or kind of cycling apps. It's using similar technology, but we've um, invested in some kind of proprietary IP based on the data and based on our community to understand how to interpret information through a lens of accessibility. So it's collected in the background um, and, and it all comes to us in a report that we're able to kind of analyze, um, but it doesn't require people to really do anything in order to measure it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll do one more question before we end things. And again, thanks to Corey for answering some in the in the back end with typing them in. Um, Stephanie, she's from Minnesota State Parks and Trails, um, asking if your app has the ability to pull in a data feed. They have an extensive data already collected in their trail system or on their trail system. And generally they don't work to populate third-party apps or sites, but we have it all available as a public feed. So I would say absolutely yes. We ingest data from all different types of sources. We've got our relationships with Google Maps. We've got um, many folks that uh, contribute to our platform. Uh, so if you've got great, reliable data, uh, we would love to take a look at it. Absolutely. Again, you could just reach out uh, at Access Now through the website or through our hello inbox. Uh, and we would love to learn more. Absolutely. Great. Thank well, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Maya. And of course, we do have a lot more, many more questions that we were not able to answer, but I definitely encourage you to reach out to hello at accessnow.ca um, and they'll take care of you there. Of course, you can always contact American Trails and we'll put you in touch with them as well. Um, and uh, this resources slide that you see here will be emailed in my follow-up email, so you will get the email um, 
along with the link to the recording and the closed caption transcript. And I want to again thank the partners of this webinar that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service and my black screen. <laughs> uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for this next webinar in our Advancing Trails webinar series. Again, it's free, um, along with free learning credits. And a reminder, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get a notification when the webinar recording is posted, which is usually within a few hours following the webinar. And that's youtube.com slash American Trails. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.